Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm instructor Jim Pytel and today's topic of discussion is the electrical properties of squirrel cage induction motors. Our objective is to examine the electrical properties of the squirrel cage induction motor, like current, real and reactive power, power factor and efficiency, at and at other than the rated conditions and the speed torque curve. This lecture operates under the assumption the viewers watch the squirrel cage induction motors mechanical properties lecture available at the Big Bad Tech channel. If you haven't watched this lecture or only dimly recall its contents, by all means, please take the time to watch it now. Additionally, it is presumed the viewer is skilled in the analysis of balanced three-phase AC systems as well as AC power calculations. As you are no doubt aware, the speed torque curve and the power curve for a Design B squirrel cage induction motor looks something like this. There are several identifiable points of interest on these curves. The unloaded condition, the rated condition, the breakdown torque or maximum torque condition, the peak mechanical power condition, and the locked rotor condition. Let us begin our tour with a rated condition. For the purposes of comparison, let us consider a 2 horsepower motor with a synchronous speed of 1800 RPM intended to operate using 208 volt line to line 60 Hz 3 phase AC. Let us begin our tour with a rated condition. Inspection of the motor nameplate demonstrates this motor's rated speed is 1725 RPM. Given a synchronous speed of 1800 RPM, this corresponds to roughly 4.2% slip. A unit conversion demonstrates 2 horsepower is equal to 1492 watts. An algebraic manipulation of the mechanical power formula, solving for unknown torque, demonstrates the motor produces roughly 8.3 newton meters of torque at the rated condition. Let's now examine electrical properties at the rated condition. Further inspection of the motor nameplate demonstrates the motor's rated current at 208 volts is 6.5 amps and has a power factor of 0.77 at the rated condition. Apparent power for a balanced three-phase AC system with a line-to-line -line voltage times line current times square root 3. Substituting in the given values in the motor nameplate, demonstrates the motor experiences 2,341.7 volt amps, or roughly 2.3 kilovolt amperes of apparent power. Real power is apparent power times power factor. 0.77 times roughly 2.3 kilovolt amperes demonstrates the motor consumes 1,803.1 watts, or roughly 1.8 kilowatts of real power input, to yield the 1,492 watts of usable mechanical power output. Efficiency is output over input. This corresponds to an efficiency of roughly 82.7%. Inspection of the motor nameplate does indeed confirm efficiency is close to the specified 82.5% at the rated condition. Not directly specified on this nameplate is the amount of reactive power consumed by this motor at the rated condition. Even so, we should be able to calculate it given the data we have before us. An algebraic manipulation of the apparent power formula, solving for reactive power, demonstrates the motor consumes 1,494.1 bars, or roughly 1.5 kilobars of reactive power. This amount of reactive power is cyclically exchanged between the supply and the motor and goes towards the establishment of the rotating magnetic field central to the operation of induction motors. Given the inductive nature of this motor, we should expect current through each winding to lag the voltage across each winding by a relative 39.6 degrees, where 39.6 degrees is the inverse cosine of power factor of 0.77. It's important to realize that all the data specified in the previous motor nameplate is at the rated condition, i.e. a single point on the complete speed torque curve. This is to suggest that the data in the motor nameplate is but a tiny, tiny picture of a much, much larger landscape. Our goal is to discuss the range of possibilities at and at other than the rated condition. Let's start with the basics. First, the rated condition is an important condition on the speed torque curve because motors ordinarily operate it around the rated condition. Why would you buy an expensive 4 horsepower motor if you could get by with a cheaper 2 horsepower motor? Why would you try to use a 1 horsepower motor to do a 2 horsepower job? Use a 2 horsepower motor. At and around the rated conditions, we get pretty predictable results. If we were to zoom in on the far right side of the speed torque and power curve, inside this narrow region, the motor operates as one might expect. Namely, unload the motor, it'll speed up, and load the motor up, it'll slow down. Sure, there's a roll off and it's not exactly linear, but if you squint your eyes just right, it looks linear enough. At and at anything to the right of the rated condition, the motor can theoretically operate more or less continuously without ill effects unless it's specified as having intermittent duty cycle. In contrast, anything to the left of the rated condition would be an overload condition, where the motor can temporarily operate, however, not for any length of time. If it remained in a sustained overload condition, we might eventually see this motor damaged or destroyed. If we were to restrict ourselves to the far right side of the speed torque curve, Think about this simple division between underloaded and overloaded and try to predict how the following electrical properties might respond to these two states. 
current, power, of which there are two types, real and reactive, power factor, and efficiency. Let's start with the easiest electrical property to predict, current. Undoubtedly, an underloaded motor should draw less current, and an overloaded motor should draw more current. I will be so bold to predict that any underloaded condition to the right of the rated condition will result in the motor drawing less than the rated 6.5 amps, whereas an overload condition to the left of the rated condition will result in the motor drawing more than the rated 6.5 amps. It seems logical. My question to you is this. What happens at the no-load condition, the far, far right-hand side of the speed, torque, and power curve, i.e. an occasion when the motor is spinning respectively fast, yet producing no torque and zero watts of mechanical power output? Will the motor draw no current? If it does draw current, where is that power being directed? Remember, there's still a rotating magnetic field. Additionally, what's the efficiency at the no-load condition? The answer to all these questions really sets up for an understanding of the electrical properties for the complete operational range. Most likely at the no-load condition, the motor will still draw current, albeit a much smaller magnitude than the rated current. This is sometimes specified as the NLA, or no-load amperes, on a motor nameplate. If the motor is drawing current, the motor is still consuming power, of which there are two dimensions, real and reactive. Think about what's going on at the no-load condition. The motor is spinning, i.e. there's still a rotating magnetic field, meaning it will still consume reactive power, but it's not doing anything useful, i.e. the small amount of real power it's consuming isn't going towards useful torque, but rather it's going towards losses like heat, friction, and or noise. In summary, in comparison to the rated condition, at the no-load condition, the motor continues to consume reactive power, yet less real power. Proportionally more of apparent power is being directed towards reactive power and less towards real. This means power factor decreases. We might therefore expect current through each winding to increasingly lag the voltage across each winding. Additionally, think of efficiency at the no load condition. The motor still consumes a small amount of real power, kind of for heat, friction, and noise losses. However, the motor isn't producing any usable torque or mechanical power. Efficiency at no load conditions would be 0%. In summary, at no load conditions, current would decrease, power factor would decrease, real power would decrease, reactive power might remain relatively constant, and efficiency would be 0%. Now, start at the no load condition and think about how these same properties respond as one increasingly returns the motor to the rated condition. Current should increase, power factor should increase, real power should increase, reactive power should remain relatively constant, and given more input is being directed towards useful output, efficiency should increase. It makes sense. Let's now examine overload conditions in the left of the rated condition. Think about what's happening at the left of the rated condition. The motor is producing more and more usable mechanical power output, yet it's operating at a condition above which it's been designed for. It's really more of the same we observe transitioning from the no-load condition to the rated condition with one minor exception. Current increases, power factor increases, real power increases, and reactive power remains relatively constant. Really, the only exception is efficiency. Given the motor is operating in excess of its design capacity, we might expect efficiency to decrease. In fact, besides the relatively linear nature of speed and torque and power at the rated conditions, it's largely for reasons of efficiency that motors are operated at or near the rated conditions. Notably, motors are more efficient when they're operated at or near the rated conditions. Operating a motor at the rated conditions is like dropping Pac-Man into a maze full of dots. That's what it's designed to do, and it's going to do it well. Now keep in mind these are quick generalizations only. Peak efficiency may not occur exactly at the rated conditions, but close enough. Another overgeneralization I've made is with respect to reactive power. In truth, reactive power isn't really constant for this narrow range, and you might expect the motor to consume slightly more reactive power at peak mechanical power output and less at no-load conditions. This being said, reactive power is relatively constant, where the term relative is in quotation marks. I think the easiest way to illustrate these idiosyncrasies regarding real and reactive power is to plot real and reactive power consumption not as a function of rotational speed, but rather mechanical power output. At no load conditions to the far left hand side, the motor produces no mechanical power output. The motor, however, still consumes a small amount of real power, accounting for losses like heat, noise, and friction. The motor additionally consumes an amount of reactive power necessary to establish the rotating magnetic field. As we transition to the rated conditions, the motor produces the rated mechanical power output. 
in our previous example, 2 horsepower or 1,492 watts. To yield this usable power output, as we demonstrated, the motor consumes an increased amount of roughly 1.8 kilowatts of real power. Where a majority of this real power is directed towards useful output, and about 300 watts is directed towards losses like heat, friction, or noise. The motor additionally consumes roughly 1.5 kilobars of reactive power necessary to establish the rotating magnetic field. Finally, as the motor transitions to peak power conditions, the motor produces peak mechanical power output. The motor consumes an increased amount of real power and only slightly more reactive power. In summary, as mechanical power output goes up, real power consumed by the motor understandably must also go up. Reactive power does go up, especially at the end, However, for the most part, it's relatively constant. Let's now examine efficiency. If we plotted efficiency on the same type of graph, we might expect 0% at the no load condition and peak efficiency at the rated conditions. Efficiency most likely decreases near peak power conditions since the motor is operating above its design capacity. As long as we're drawing a bunch of graphs, what about power factor? Power factor is the portion of apparent power being directed towards real power. At the no load condition, a majority of apparent power is being directed towards reactive power and only a small amount is directed towards real power. This corresponds to a low power factor figure. At the rated condition, more of apparent power is being directed towards real power and reactive power remains relatively constant. This corresponds to an increased power factor figure. Finally, at peak power conditions, a vast majority of apparent power is being directed towards real power and reactive power only slightly increases. This again corresponds to an increased power factor figure. Keep in mind, we're making serious generalizations for the far right-hand side of the speed torque curve only at this point. We'll examine complete range in a moment. What's nice about these generalizations is that they're generally true for most squirrel cage induction motors. If you're looking for specific data about a specific motor, remember to always consult the manufacturer's data sheet for that specific motor of interest. Now that we've got a general idea of what to expect, let's discuss the electrical theory behind these generalizations and discuss the behavior of electrical properties like current, power, power factor, and efficiency over the larger range of the speed torque and power curves. I really struggled with how to model squirrel cage induction motor windings for the purposes of this lecture series. The way I saw it, I had three options. Easy, not so easy, and super hard. The easy method simply visualizes each winding as a variable impedance. This method kind of works, but it ignores some interesting and important electrical phenomena. Any understanding using this model would be superficial at best. The more complicated, not so easy method visualizes each winding as a different impedance components in series with a variable voltage source in opposition to applied voltage. This method takes a little bit more effort, however it yields more usable results. The super hard method uses the Steinmetz or T equivalent circuit, consisting of a series parallel combination of stator resistance, leakage reactance, reflected rotor resistance and rotor leakage reactance, slip and magnetizing reactants using super confusing calculus that incorporates functions of flux density, torque, and other things that are best ignored. Ain't nobody got time for that. In the interest of balancing completeness with timeliness, we're opting for the not so easy method, where each winding is visualized as different impedance components in series with a variable voltage source in opposition to applied voltage. This does require a little bit more involved circuit analysis than the easy method, but it yields a reasonably complete picture in a reasonable amount of time. Do not for a moment think this is an officially sanctioned model accurate in every respect, nor does it represent reality in every detail in every sense. Windings are not composed of variable resistors, variable inductors, and variable voltage sources. They're just windings. These are just imagined elements accounting for various effects. The elements inside the model of choice include a small variable resistance, which is meant to represent the losses inherent in the motor's operation. This could be resistance losses, core losses, sound losses, windage losses, bearing losses, or anything else that doesn't go towards real usable actual output. Any power consumed by this component would be considered a loss. I'd like to say this component is small enough that you could ignore it, but it isn't and you can't. The second component is a variable resistor which is meant to represent the real power consumed by the winding that goes towards useful mechanical power output. For the purposes of this lecture, we're going to kind of lump together the losses and output components into a single variable resistive component. The third component is a variable inductor, which represents the reactive power consumed by the winding during operation. This is that portion of apparent power that goes towards establishing the rotating magnetic field on the stator. Although this power doesn't go towards useful output, but is rather cyclically exchanged with the supply, it's an absolutely necessary component of motor operation. Without it, the motor would just sit there and do nothing, kind of like your lab partner. 
All these components are representative of the motor's operational state on the speed torque curve. At certain points, the reactive power can be greater than the real portion, and at other points, vice versa. You'd think there'd be a simple formula to account for the magnitude of each component, depending upon the motor's operational state, but there isn't. The real component slopes gently downwards as a function of rotational speed, slopes rapidly upwards as the motor approaches peak power, then nosedives as it approaches the no-load speed. The reactive component does something totally different. The reactive component starts sloping downwards as a function of rotational speed, then rapidly skyrockets as it approaches the no-load speed. In the interest of time, for the purpose of this and remaining related lectures, I'm just going to give you the component values and let you figure out the consequences by yourself using Ohm's Law. You do know Ohm's Law, don't you? The last property illustrated using the not-so-easy method is the variable voltage source in opposition to applied voltage. This is meant to account for counter-electromotive force, or CEMF, a self-generated oppositional voltage the motor windings experience while in operation. You'll recall in the Squirrel Cage Induction Motors Mechanical Properties Lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech Channel, I explained the operational principle of Squirrel Cage Induction Motors using primitive graphics that I thankfully will not repeat here. As a summary of the process, you recall current flowing in the stator windings creates a rotating magnetic field which induces current on the rotor. Consequently, the induced current flowing in the rotor creates its own magnetic field on the rotor which then interacts with the stator rotating magnetic field such that the rotor is twisted or dragged along with it. An additional interaction occurs that I only briefly alluded to in the aforementioned lectures. As does the stator's magnetic field interact with the rotor, the rotor's magnetic field similarly interacts with the stator, kind of like the force you'd feel against your foot if you kicked a soccer ball. The ball feels the force of your foot, but your foot consequently feels the force of the ball. Once the rotor starts turning, if you want to think of it this way, the stationary windings on the stator will experience relative movement of a magnetic field, as would a generator. As a result, an oppositional or counter voltage would be generated with the opposite polarity of that that initiated the action. The magnitude of counter-electromotive force is proportional to speed. The faster the motor spins, the more counter-electromotive force is produced. At rest, counter-electromotive force would be zero volts. As the rotational speed increases, counter-electromotive force increases. For our purposes, we're going to consider this a linear phenomenon. This is the effect that largely explains inrush. More appropriately, it's the lack of this effect that explains inrush. A motor at rest is not producing counter-electromotive force, and upon closure of a full voltage starter, the winding would experience all voltage. We'll examine inrush calculations and inrush theory in greater detail in later lectures. An extremely effective way of explaining counter-electromotive force is using these two simple examples. Consider a 20 ohm resistive component in series with a 20 ohm reactive component in series with a variable voltage source meant to simulate counter-electromotive force that happens to have a value of zero volts supplied by a fixed 120 volt source. The total impedance seen by the source is roughly 28.3 ohms at an angle of 45 degrees, which experiences a complete 120 volt differential. An application of Ohm's law demonstrates that the source supplies roughly 4.3 amps at an angle of negative 45 degrees. You'll note with zero volts of counter-electromotive force, the winding experiences the full 120 volt differential and as a result draws a substantial amount of current. Now consider the same 20 ohm resistive component in series with the same 20 ohm reactive component in series with a variable voltage source that now happens to have a value of 70 volts supplied by a fixed 120 volt source. You will note the polarity markers on the fixed source and the variable counter electromotive force component specify that this is a series oppositional relationship. Both the source and counter electromotive force simultaneously peak. However, given their polarity markers are in opposition to one another, an application of Kirchhoff's voltage law demonstrates the series impedances experience a differential of 120 minus 70 or only 50 volts. An application of Ohm's law demonstrates the source supplies roughly 1.8 amps at an angle of negative 45 degrees. You'll note with increased counter-electromotive force, the same impedance experiences less of a differential and as a result draws less current. This again explains the vast disparity of current drawn at inrush versus at the rated and no load conditions, i.e. opposite ends of the speed torque curve. Even if the resistive and reactive components stay the same at these two extremes, which they don't, a motor at locked rotor conditions, i.e. zero RPMs, will experience more current because there is less counter-electromotive force. Whereas a motor at no load conditions, 
i.e. extremely high RPMs, will experience less current because there is more counter-electromotive force. Like I said, we'll examine inrush in greater details in later lectures. More to the point of this lecture is that every component inside this model changes at different points of the speed torque curve. Given specified supply voltage magnitude, counter-electromotive force magnitude, and impedance values, it should be well within your capacity to calculate current and power. Allow me to demonstrate. For this series of examples, let's go ahead and use a half horsepower motor with a synchronous speed of 1800 RPM intended to operate using 120 volt line to neutral, 208 volt line to line, 60 hertz, three phase AC, and a Y configuration. In no load condition, let's say the motor rotates at 1780 RPM and each winding can be modeled as a resistive component of 15 ohms in series the reactive component of 50 ohms at the no load speed of 1780 RPM. Let's say the motor experiences 70 volts of counter electromotive force in opposition to applied voltage. The total impedance presented by each winding is a series combination of the real and reactive components with a value of roughly 52.2 ohms at an angle of 73.3 degrees. Each winding would experience a 120 volt differential in one direction and 70 volts in another for a total differential of 50 volts. An application of Ohm's law demonstrates each winding draws roughly 957.8 milliamperes, lagging each phase by a relative 73.3 degrees. This is the current the motor would draw in the no load condition, a point at the speed torque curve where speed is high, but torque is zero, an occasion of zero watts of mechanical power output. Given the large degree of phase shift between voltage and current, it's obvious the majority of apparent power is being directed towards reactive power and only a small portion towards real power. In the no load condition, any real power consumed by the motor would be considered a loss. Speaking of power, let's talk about power and the drawbacks of the model we're employing. As you are no doubt aware, AC power is the product of voltage times current, complex conjugate, where only the relative phase shift between voltage and current is to be considered. Once a user has calculated apparent power, it can then be resolved into its real and reactive components as previously. This method works all the time, even with this model. In ordinary circumstances, there exist two other methods used to calculate AC power, namely current squared times impedance and voltage squared divided by impedance. However, employing this model does not allow the use of these techniques. I say again, you cannot use current squared times impedance or voltage squared divided by impedance to solve for power with this model because these impedance components don't exist. They're just a way of modeling the windings behavior at different points on the speed torque curve. To properly calculate power for each winding modeled in this fashion, one must use voltage times current complex conjugate where only the relative phase shift between voltage and current is to be considered. An application of the AC power formula demonstrates each winding experiences 114.9 volt amperes of apparent power, of which 33 watts is directed towards real power and 110.1 bars is directed towards a reactive interchange. Total real power is a summation of individual real powers, which yields 99.1 watts. Given the no load condition is an occasion of zero torque and zero watts of mechanical power output, this means 99.1 watts is directed towards losses like heat, friction, and or noise. This amounts to an efficiency of 0%. Total reactive power is the summation of individual reactive powers, which yields 330.3 VARs. This is the amount of reactive power cyclically exchanged between the motor and the source to establish the rotating magnetic field necessary for the motor's operation. Finally, let's examine power factor at the no load condition. As we have observed, there's a substantial phase shift between voltage and current at no load conditions and a majority of apparent power is being directed towards a reactive interchange. As such, we should expect a low power factor. Power factor is several things, principally the cosine of the phase shift between voltage and current and the ratio of real over apparent power. Either calculation results in a power factor of roughly 0.29. Go ahead and copy these results at the no load condition in your notebook for purposes of later comparison. Let's perform the same analysis at the rated condition. At the rated condition, when the motor produces the rated mechanical power output of half a horsepower, let's say it rotates at 1730 RPM. A unit conversion demonstrates a half horsepower is 373 watts. An algebraic manipulation of the mechanical power formula solving for torque demonstrates the motor produces roughly 2.1 newton meters of torque. At the rated condition, let's say each winding can be bottled as a resistive component of 27 ohms in series of a reactive component of 20 ohms. At the reduced rated speed of 1730 RPM, the motor experiences a reduced amount of 67 volts of counter electromotive force in opposition to applied voltage. The total impedance presented by each winding is a series combination of the real and reactive components for a value of roughly 33.6 ohms at an angle of 36.5 degrees.
Each winding experiences a 120 volt differential in one direction and 67 volts in another for a total differential of 53 volts. Not only has each winding impedance magnitude and angle changed, at the reduced rated speed, each winding experiences less counter electromotive force. All of these changes should result in more current and more apparent power being directed towards real power. Let's see if this is the case. An application of Ohm's law demonstrates each winding draws roughly 1.6 amps, lagging each phase by a relative 36.5 degrees. As we expected, current magnitude increased and phase shift decreased in comparison to the no load condition. Apparent power is equal to voltage times current complex conjugate. An application of the AC power formula demonstrates each winding experiences 189.3 volt amperes of apparent power, of which roughly 152.1 watts is directed towards real power and 112.7 VARs is directed towards the reactive interchange. Total real power is the summation of individual real powers, which yields 456.3 watts. Given the rated condition is an occasion of half horsepower output, or 373 watts output, this results in an efficiency of roughly 81.7%. Total reactive power is a summation of individual reactive powers, which yields 338 VARs. You'll note at the rated condition, the motor consumes a roughly equivalent amount of reactive power in comparison to the no load condition. This is to be expected. Reactive power consumption is relatively constant. Finally, let's examine power factor at the rated condition. The motor is doing real work and more of apparent power is being directed towards real power. Phase shift between voltage and current is decreased. As such, we should expect a higher power factor. Either method of calculation results in a power factor of roughly 0.8. In summary, in comparison to the no load condition, at the rated condition, the motor draws more current, the phase shift between voltage and current decreases, power factor increases, real power consumed by the motor increases, reactive power consumed by the motor only slightly increases, and efficiency increases. Go ahead and copy these results at the rated condition in your notebook for purposes of later comparison. All right, one more illustrated example, a brief summary, and then we'll call it a day. Let's perform the same calculations at peak mechanical power output. We should expect more of the same with a couple minor variations. Namely, we should expect this motor to draw more current, the phase shift between voltage and current should decrease, power factor should increase, and real power consumed by the motor should increase. The two exceptions we might see is the motor to be less efficient at peak power conditions, and it will most likely draw slightly more reactive power. At the peak mechanical power output condition, let's say this motor can produce 3 quarter horsepower output at 1680 RPM. A unit conversion demonstrates 3 quarter horsepower is 559.5 watts. An algebraic manipulation of the mechanical power formula solved for torque demonstrates the motor produces roughly 3.2 newton meters of torque at the peak mechanical power output condition. At peak conditions, let's say each winding can be modeled as a resistive component of 20 ohms and a reactive component of 9 ohms. At the reduced rated speed of 1680 RPM, the motor experiences a reduced amount of 66 volts of counter-electromotive force in opposition to applied voltage. The total impedance presented by each winding is a series combination of the real and reactive components with a value of roughly 21.9 ohms at an angle of 24.2 degrees. Each winding experiences a 120 volt differential in one direction and 66 volts in another for a total differential of 54 volts. Not only has each winding impedance magnitude and angle changed, at the reduced rotational speed, each winding experiences less counter electromotive force. All of these changes should result in more current and more apparent power being directed towards real power. Let's see if this is the case. An application of Ohm's law demonstrates each winding draws roughly 2.5 amps, lagging each phase by a relative of 24.2 degrees. As we expected, current magnitude increased and phase shift decreased in comparison to the rated condition. An application of the AC power formula demonstrates each winding experiences 295.5 volt amperes of apparent power, of which 269.4 watts is directed towards real power and roughly 121.2 VARs is directed towards the reactive interchange. Total real power is a summation of individual real powers, which yields 808.3 watts. Given peak power condition is an occasion of 3 quarter horsepower output, or 559.5 watts, this results in a reduced efficiency of roughly 69.2%. Total reactive power is a summation of individual reactive powers, which is 363.7 VARs. You'll note at peak mechanical power output, the reactive power consumed by the motor does increase in comparison to the rated condition, but not that much. Finally, let's examine power factor at peak mechanical power output. A significant portion of apparent power is being directed towards real power. 
Application of either power factor formula demonstrates the motor has an increased power factor of roughly 0.91. In summary, in comparison to the rated condition, at peak mechanical power output, the motor draws more current, the phase shift between voltage and current decreases, power factor increases, real power consumed by the motor increases, reactive power consumed by the motor only slightly increases, and efficiency decreases. Again, go ahead and copy these results at peak mechanical power output in your notebook for purposes of later comparison. I'm going to save you the trouble of calculating these properties for the rest of the range by summating them in this series of charts. Bust out your notes, compare the data we obtained in the last three examples for the no load, rated, and peak mechanical power output conditions. By now, you're hopefully familiar with the speed torque curve and the power curve. Let's overlay plots of current, real power efficiency, reactive power, and power factor for the larger span. Let's first take a look at current. At the no load condition, we found that the motor draws roughly 960 milliamperes. It increases to 1.6 amps at the rated condition and increases again to roughly 2.5 amps at the peak power condition. Inside the breakdown region, where both torque and mechanical power output decreases, current continues to increase until it kind of levels off at let's say 6 times the rated current, or roughly 9.6 amps. At locked rotor conditions, i.e. when RPM equals zero, we might expect a momentary inrush surge of roughly 9.6 amps. Let's now look at real power consumed by the motor and efficiency. At no load conditions, the motor consumes roughly 99 watts of real power, yet yields no mechanical power output for an efficiency of 0%. At rated conditions, we found that the motor consumes an increased amount of roughly 456 watts of real power and yields half a horsepower of 373 watts of mechanical power output for an increased efficiency of 81.7%. This is most likely at or very near peak efficiency because that's where the motor is designed to operate. At peak mechanical power output conditions, the motor consumes an increased amount of roughly 808 watts of real power and yields 3 quarter horsepower or 595.5 watts of mechanical power output for a decreased efficiency of 69.2%. You note inside the breakdown region where both torque and mechanical power output decreases, real power consumed by the motor continues to increase until it kind of levels off. Two very important observations can be made about this fact. One, this region corresponds with decreasing efficiency reaching 0% at the locked rotor condition, and two, given increasingly less mechanical power output, any real power consumed by the motor is increasingly directed towards losses. Realize those losses don't disappear into thin air, but rather they go towards self-damage. I say again, real power consumed by the motor in an overload condition isn't being directed towards usable mechanical power output, but rather damage. This is yet another reason one typically operates the motor at rated conditions and overloads are meant to be momentary in nature. Real power consumed by the motor doesn't go to work. It goes towards heat and damage. Similar observations can be made about reactive power and power factor. At the no load condition, we found the motor consumes roughly 330 VARs of reactive power, where a significant portion of apparent power is being directed towards this reactive interchange, which corresponds to a low power factor of roughly 0.3. At the rated conditions, we found that the motor consumed a slightly increased amount of 338 VARs of reactive power and a smaller portion of apparent power is being directed towards this reactive interchange, which corresponds to an increased power factor of roughly 0.8. At peak mechanical power output conditions, we found the motor consumed a slightly increased amount of roughly 360 VARs of reactive power. Phase shift decreased, which corresponds to an increased power factor of roughly 0.91. Inside the breakdown region where both torque and mechanical power output decreases, Reactive power consumed in the motor continues to slightly increase until it kind of levels off. Inside this region, the ratio of real and reactive power remains relatively constant, and power factor also kind of flatlines. There you have it. General purpose plots of torque, mechanical power output, current, real and reactive power consumption, efficiency, and power factor for the complete operational range of a squirrel cage induction motor from locked rotor conditions to the rated condition all the way up to no load speed. Again, these general purpose plots are descriptive of most squirrel cage inducted motors. However, if you're looking for specific data for a specific motor, it is incumbent upon you to look up the pertinent data on the appropriate manufacturer's data sheet. Most likely, it'll look something like this. Important points to remember. At no load conditions, the motor rotates relatively quickly but produces no torque. This is an occasion of zero watts of mechanical power output. The motor draws a small amount of current with a large degree of phase shift corresponding to a low power factor.
a majority of apparent power consumed by the motor is directed towards a reactive interchange and the small amount of real power consumed by the motor is directed towards losses. This corresponds to an efficiency of 0%. At rated conditions, the motor rotates at the rated speed. It produces a rated torque and produces the rated mechanical power output. The motor draws the rated amount of current with less phase shift, corresponding to an increased power factor. More of apparent power is being directed towards real power, and reactive power only slightly increases. Most likely, the motor experiences peak efficiency at or around the rated condition. At peak power conditions, it's more of the same with some minor variations. Current increases, power factor increases, real power consumption increases, reactive power slightly increases, only efficiency goes down. Inside the breakdown region, things kind of level out. Only efficiency continues to drop, reaching 0% at locked rotor conditions. In summary, things are as bad as they can get and they can't get much worse. It's important to realize that this is a region of decreasing mechanical power output and any real power consumed by the motor is increasingly directed towards losses and those losses often take the form of increased heat and self-damage. The moral of the story is, don't operate a motor in an overload condition for very long unless your goal is to destroy it. Keep in mind, a manufacturer data sheet may not specify electrical properties for the entire range of operational speeds, but rather limit data to the narrow region around the rated condition. You recall we examined a motor data sheet in the squirrel cage induction motors mechanical properties lectures that did exactly that. Your job is to be sufficiently aware of what data is being plotted on what axis and discriminating between the numerous types of dashed lines on the plot. Consider one such example of a 3 horsepower Design D squirrel cage induction motor. Recall, Design D motors are slightly different than Design B motors in that they experience peak torque at locked rotor conditions and are designed for loads with large static inertia like hoists. Other than that, we should observe similar properties to the Design B motors we've thus far discussed. This motor is intended to operate using 460 volt three phase AC with a synchronous speed of 1200 RPM. The key data point to remember is that this is a three horsepower motor. The horizontal X axis isn't speed. It's percent power output, where 100% of rated power output, or 3 horsepower, is this vertical line right here. Anything to the right of the vertical 3 horsepower line is an overload condition. Anything on the vertical line is the rated condition. Anything to the left of the vertical 3 horsepower line is an underloaded condition. We see this motor can produce 0% up to 150% of 3 horsepower, or 4.5 horsepower at peak power conditions. This data sheet plots torque using a dash line, RPM using another type of dash line, current also using another type of dash line, efficiency on a solid line, and power factor using another type of dash line. The intersection of each dash line with the vertical 3 horsepower line is most likely what is specified in the motor nameplate. For example, if this dash line means rotational speed, it looks like at 100% of rated power, the rated speed might be around 1120 RPM. A rotational speed of 1120 RPM for a synchronous speed of 1200 RPM represents a slip of roughly 6.7%. You'd expect that for a design D motor of this size. You'll note the vertical Y axis specifying the rotational speed starts at 1200 RPM and goes only to 1100 RPM. Basically, this chart is only presenting data on the extreme right hand side of the larger speed torque curve. Why? Because that's where you should operate this motor, i.e. around the rated condition. You'll additionally note that the dashed rotational speed line slopes downward left to right. It makes sense. In the underloader regions to the left of the rated condition 
the motor speeds up. In the overloader regions to the right of the rating condition, the motor slows down. If this dash line means current, it looks like at 100% of rated power, the motor draws 5.4 amps. You'll note the dash current line slopes upward left to right. It makes sense. In the underloader region to the left of the rated condition, the motor draws less current. In the overloader region to the right of the rated condition, the motor draws more current. If this dash line means power factor, it looks like at 100% of rated power, the motor has a power factor of roughly 0.64. You will note the dashed power factor line slopes upward left to right. This again makes sense. In the underloader regions to the left of the rated condition, most of apparent power is directed towards a reactive interchange. Whereas in the overloader region to the right of the rated condition, some of apparent power is still being directed towards a reactive interchange, however the motor consumes proportionally more real power. This corresponds to an increased power factor. Finally, if this solid line means efficiency, it looks like at 100% of rated power, the motor is roughly 81.5% efficient. You note this motor doesn't actually experience peak efficiency at the rated condition, but rather a little earlier. But come on, it's close enough. At no load conditions, the motor still experiences 0% in efficiency, and in the overload regions to the right of the rated condition, the motor's efficiency decreases in comparison to the rated condition. Long story short, all the information is right there on the data sheet and it behaves like we'd expect. One last series of calculations involving this data sheet before we bring this lecture to a close. On a very basic level, you should understand a motor converts electrical power to mechanical power. Ideally, these figures should meet in the middle somewhere to a reasonable degree of accuracy at any and at all operating conditions. Let's see if this is the case for one such operating condition. Since it's the most important, consider the rated condition. At the rated speed of 1120 RPM, the motor produces the rated mechanical power output of 3 horsepower, where a unit conversion demonstrates 3 horsepower is equal to 2238 watts. An algebraic manipulation of the mechanical power formula, solving for unknown torque, demonstrates the motor should be producing roughly 19.1 newton meters of torque, where another unit conversion demonstrates 19.1 newton meters is equal to roughly 14.1 foot pounds of torque. If we follow the intersection of the dash double dash torque curve with the vertical rated condition, we find rated torque to be slightly in excess of 14 foot pounds as we'd expect. At the rated condition, the motor is known to have an efficiency of roughly 81.5%. An algebraic manipulation of the efficiency formula, solving for unknown power input, demonstrates the motor must consume at least 2,746 watts of real power to yield the necessary 2,238 watts of output. Let's now examine the electrical properties at the rated condition. Recall the motor draws 5.4 amps at a 0.64 power factor at the rated conditions using 460 volt three phase AC. Given this motor is a balanced load, we can make use of the single watt meter method to determine power, where apparent power is square root three times line to line voltage times line current. Substituting our given values yields 4,302.4 volt amperes, or roughly 4.3 kilovolt amperes of apparent power. Real power is apparent power times power factor. Roughly 4.3 kilovolt amperes times 0.64 yields roughly 2,753.5 watts of real power, extremely close to the 2,746 watts we calculated earlier using mechanical power output and efficiency. It all makes sense. One should be able to use this chart, or something like it, to calculate the same data at other operational points. Importantly, the mechanical and electrical calculations should support each other to a reasonable degree of accuracy. All right, that's about it for today. In conclusion, this lecture examined the electrical properties of squirrel cage induction motors at and at other than the rated conditions. We examined current, real power, efficiency, reactive power, and power factor. Additionally, we introduced a simplified model of a motor winding, including counter electromotive force, and inspected and learned how to interpret a motor data sheet. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource, and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.